I'm going to pray and then I will hand uh, back to Dave Bookless, who is Director of Theology at Arusha. So let's pray. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your help and your grace as we seek your face this evening. Uh, you are the Lord Almighty. You are the King of glory. This fragile world is yours. Uh, creator, sustainer, judge of all for how we live on it. And we ask our Father for your transforming mercy as Laura speaks to us. We ask for our honour of you, our love of neighbour and our global Christian witness. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Dave. Thank you so much, Charlie. And it's lovely to be with you all this evening for the annual John Stott London Lecture. Uh, and just to, by way of introduction, this lecture is put on jointly by four organisations, each of which John Stott had a close relationship with. So I work as Director of Theology for Arosha International, and uh, Arosha was an organisation that John Stott had a lot of time for and spent a lot of time with. And then, of course, we have All Souls Lang and Place, where Charlie is based, uh, which was John's church for so many years. We have the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, uh, which John helped found, and we have Langham Partnership as well, Langham International, which also John founded. So four organisations that work closely together, and we take it in turns to each kind of uh, sponsor and lead on the lecture. And this year was Arusha's turn, and uh, we have are delighted to be able to invite Laura Yoda, who I'll introduce properly in just a moment. So Laura S. Meitzner Yoda, is Director and John Stott Chair of Human Needs and Global Resources and Professor of Environmental Studies at Wheaton College in Illinois. Uh, in her student days, she lived in London and worshipped at All Souls Langham Place, sitting with others, sometimes quite literally, at the feet of John Stott in the basement of his flat in Weymouth Street. During that time, her interest in ecology and nature was also stimulated by an internship with Professor Sir Gillian France at Kew Gardens. Since then, Dr Yoda has lived and researched amongst human environment interactions in remote villages and urban centres of Southeast Asia and Latin America. She sought to understand rural people's realities by working alongside smallholder farmers, forest dwellers, and to communicate their priorities to policymakers at national and international level. Much of her work has been in situations of conflict and disaster, of chronic poverty or political marginalization. And yet in those contexts, she's seen amongst people hope and joy and how much there is to learn. In Asia and in North America, she enjoys guiding students through intercultural learning and research in field contexts. And since 2008, she's taught about sustainability and field research on rural and international development in Thailand, in Bhutan, in Indiana, and elsewhere. Her interests include languages, writing, tropical fruit, botanical exploration, walking in forest shade, swimming, and asking questions. And her publications, which we'll hear more about, uh, include editing uh, with Sa the late Sam Berry, the book John Stott on Creation Care, and also editing Living Radical Discipleship. She serves on various boards, including Tear Fund USA and the advisory board for the Center of Reconciliation at Duke Divinity School. And personally, I've been privileged to get to know Laura in recent years and have come to admire her academic rigor and her constant curiosity, her intercultural gift for friendship and her promotion of marginalized voices. And overall, the way her clear faith in Jesus and her passion for justice and for God's creation shines through her whole life and her lifestyle. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's John Stott London Lecture given by Laura Yoda. Greetings to all of you and special thanks to Dave Bookless for organizing this lecture. Please have a piece of paper and a pen or pencil handy, as there will be two things for you to do in the time ahead. 
If we were at All Souls Langham Place, I'd like to look up to the balcony and acknowledge Mary and Dennis Bambury, who shared their home and lives with me and introduced me to All Souls in 1988. They included me in their beginners group that met in the Weymouth Street Vicarage basement, where sometimes John Stott had occasion to visit. To start out, let's do something together. Wherever you are in the world, I invite you to remember an outdoor place that is for you one of the most beautiful and life-giving places you know well. Do you have it in your mind? Close your eyes for just a moment and think about what it feels like to be in that place. Is it warm, is it warm or cool? Still or breezy? What are the noises you hear? Who or what is around you there? Other people, trees, pets, vehicles, birds. For some people, this may be a place of rest. For others, it may be a place of work or movement, a garden you cultivate, a yard where you play with others, a body of water that you paddle across, populated streets you regularly traverse that feels like home, a field or a forest you walk through. And if you have your piece of paper, write down the name of the place. You may have to give it a name. Keep this there with you. I invite you to sketch that place to draw a few features throughout the next few minutes. And we'll come back to this later. Considering our topic here, of loving our future neighbor, earthkeeping as Christian witness, there are three themes that will orient our time today. They are neighbor and future and witness. In this discussion, I'll make reference to the new volume, John Stott on Creation Care, originally compiled by Dr. R.J. Sam Berry. I will also discuss some insights from my work with smallholder farmers, ecological experts, whose lives and livelihoods give them an extraordinarily close-up view of natural systems and their change. But first, a brief note about the John Stott on Creation Care book and giving credit where it is due. The fuller story of this book's own journey is in the preface. Sam Berry got the idea for this volume in 2013, and together with others, he collected and transcribed materials, consulted archives, and wrote commentary over the next four years. He passed away in March, 2018, leaving an unpublished manuscript, which Caroline Berry gave to me to carry forward as possible. And so it proceeded to publication with much assistance and understanding from the original supporters and copyright holders. And I look forward to seeing how others can make use of this collection now that it's available. It comes as a surprise to many that Stott spoke and wrote as much on this topic as he did. Sam Berry noted that it may have seemed odd to some that Stott included creation care as one of the eight essential but neglected characteristics of Christian discipleship in his final book, The Radical Disciple, published in Stott's last year. This new book traces how Stott developed this commitment to creation care from a biblical foundation and how it became so intertwined with his missiology that it earned this place in his deliberately final work. Stott's earliest writings on creation from 1966 focused on Psalms. He noted that the works of the Lord can and should be seen in both creation and redemption. In 1977, Stott's first creation care sermon, God and the Environment, preached at All Souls, centered on Psalm 104. It noted that many of us have a good doctrine of salvation and a bad doctrine of creation. Some of us don't have a doctrine of creation at all. We're not interested in the works of the Lord, but we ought to be, he said. A talk prepared for the 2003 InterVarsity Urbana Conference expanded this theme, and I quote, since both creation and redemption are termed the works of Yahweh, it is evident that we should hold them together 
and not acquiesce in their separation. God's mighty acts in creation and redemption are to be made known throughout the world. We are not to be afraid to bear witness to the creator as well as to the redeemer. Just as the apostle Paul did when confronted by the philosophers in Athens, we are to hold together in our evangelistic witness, the creation and the cross, the God who made us and who has redeemed us in Jesus Christ. If either is omitted, our gospel has been truncated. Stott spoke strongly against the dualistic separation of spirit and matter or soul and body, considering enlightenment dualism a dangerous and quote disastrous consequence of the fall that inhibits a biblical understanding of God and of scripture and its outworking in our lives. He was well known for his opposition to fissioning the gospel, but he also saw such dualism as impeding our earth keeping. Quote, we need as strong and biblical a doctrine of creation as we do of redemption. Then we would care for creation more conscientiously than we usually do. Stott's sermons and writings on creation care as other topics repeatedly called for overcoming what he recognized as unbiblical compartmentalized thinking. He believed that visibly living out Christian commitments was a mandate, not a theoretical ideal. And we'll see several examples of this going forward. Now let's consider our first theme of neighbor. For this, of course, we must turn to Luke 10, 25 to 37, and Jesus' response to the curious lawyer scholar in the very familiar story of the Good Samaritan. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. We see that twice in this story, Jesus gives a charge to model action to the scholar bringing theoretical questions. In verse 28, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. In verse 37, go and do likewise. Let's take a bird's eye view of the basic actions and principles here and consider how does this relate to earthkeeping and care for the places our neighbors inhabit and reading in our current context and double listening these recent weeks. We might wonder, what does this have to do with COP26 in Glasgow? A man was passing through a remote, steeply winding, dangerous, desolate place. He was subjected to multiple forms of loss and pain. Greedy and perhaps desperate people took what the man had to sustain him and to preserve his dignity and left him alone without thought or care for his future. Some religious people saw the issue but literally sidestepped the problem. They assiduously practiced avoidant social distancing. But an outsider, Jesus' model neighbor, also passing through, 
saw this situation and had compassion, took initiative to approach and to get up close and proximate, got his own hands dirty, sacrificially gave up his own basic supplies, using them for another's need, voluntarily gave up his own comfortable, convenient, preferred form of transport, went out of his way, invested significant time and his own money to care for this stranger, paying his bills in advance. Didn't abandon him then, but also invited and drew another into the circle of care for sustained recovery. Promised to remain involved and to pay in full some unknown expense in the future, all seeking the well being of this stranger for the good of this stranger now recognized as neighbor. Now, this is truly over the top neighborliness. I wonder. Where have we seen glimpses of this kind of commitment to ongoing neighborliness in action? Compassion-based, self-sacrificial, involved in personally and physically costly ways, comfort, comfort foregoing for a stranger's well-being, generous with time and money, even with an unknown outcome, willingness to be inconvenienced for the good of another? Have we seen this, caught glimpses, in our neighborhoods, in church communities, or even international climate change events? How are neighbors and need connected? Jesus reminds us that true neighbors may be found in unexpected people and places. Let's keep our eyes wide open. This kind of embodied involvement and sacrificial sharing is at the heart of kingdom neighborliness. Stott was quite clear about the ecological dimensions of mission and the integrity of Christian witness. In his 1983 foreword to Under the Bright Wings, the early story of Arasha, Stott anticipated a question some readers might be asking. They quote, but can ecological involvement properly be included under the heading of mission? Yes, it can and should. For mission embraces everything Christ sends his people into the world to do, service as well as evangelism. And we cannot truly love and serve our neighbors if at the same time we are destroying their environment or acquiescing in its destruction or even ignoring the environmentally depleted circumstances in which so many people are condemned to live. As by the incarnation, Jesus Christ entered into our world so true incarnational mission involves entering into other people's worlds, including the world of their social and environmental reality. Let's hear Stott clearly on this point, that failure to love our neighbors can come in many forms by things done and left undone, active destruction, acquiescence, or turning a blind eye to the visible reality of environmental degradation passing by on the other side of the road. Stott does not let us off the hook, claiming that if we don't know or understand the science perhaps, therefore we're not responsible for action. He made it his Christian business to learn about natural systems. And he did this as a disciple and church leader in the modern world, not just out of hobby interest in science. True, he was introduced to natural history by his father and he developed a strong personal commitment to bird watching. His 1977 sermon put it this way, God is said in this Psalm 104 to rejoice in his works, so his people ought to rejoice in them also. And I don't hesitate to say that every Christian ought to be interested in natural history. We ought to study nature in order to be able to praise God for his works. We can't worship God adequately if we don't study his works in order to worship him who has created them. In addition to such learning, there is another element to awareness regarding understanding situations in remote areas or distant places that can often go unseen. Much of my work has been with smallholder farmers and forest dwellers in Latin America and Asia who are often in the mountains and far from roads or public services. There are about 500 million smallholder farms of less than two hectares, responsible for the food, income, and nutritional security for 2 billion people. 
since many of them intercrop various species to grow food for themselves and to sell, they preserve and create much agricultural biodiversity. Walking around their fields on foot and working with hand tools, they notice changes up close as their lives and livelihoods are directly dependent on the productivity of these particular fields. Ironically, hardworking as they are, smallholder farmers often experience food insecurity. Many practice rain-fed or non-irrigated agriculture, and they have only precarious access to land with marginal soils. They often endure other everyday forms of marginality, political neglect and denigration of their knowledge and their work. John Stott often spoke of cooperation with God as the expression of creation care. Smallholder farmers live acutely aware that they depend on God for their daily bread or rice or cassava or maize or quinoa or teff or barley or plantains or sago. Because of their circumstances, smallholder farmers are particularly vulnerable to multiple climate change effects. In talking with farmers, they nearly always talk in detail about one thing nowadays. It's a priority we all have in common. I think you can probably guess what it is. Water. Too little, too much at the wrong times, too erratic or unpredictable, responsible for flooding and landslides, and massive erosion that undoes their ongoing efforts to improve their soils. Rainfall has shifted seasons and intense storms destroy crops and homes with more severity and frequency. Droughts that used to occur one year every two decades are now extended across multiple years in a row. And the future feels ever closer. People in many regions remark about their annual 100 year floods. Intervals between crop failures due to drought or catastrophic storms do not permit past patterns of recovery before the next storm hits. Here's a typical field for a dryland area where rainfall is unpredictable. This farmer selected this land at the river's edge for use in this season and is preparing it for planting before the rains are expected. She will plant the field using a pointed dibble stick to make holes for each individual seed. You can see here some of the risks she is taking to be close to the water. What if the river overflows its channel and washes the field away? This area also has very unstable soils and landslides from the cliff above this field are frequent, especially in the rainy season. Those with enough power or social connections or wealth to access safer land elsewhere need not take these risks. Many remote places are at high risk of food insecurity. In our second year of living in Timor, a typhoon came through just a few weeks before the annual maize harvest, flattening and burying nearly all the crop plants under mud. This storm also felled many tamarind trees where many children gathered their own food. They ate the rock hard seeds we throw away as well as the sour coating normally used. Walking between mountain villages, I saw the skin of a cow stretched out across a small road, held in place with rocks. I wondered aloud how this hide would be used. My village companions looked at me quizzically. What a strange question. Well, of course, they said, this leather was being prepared for use in the hungry season when it would be cut and boiled together with grass and salt and chili peppers to make a broth that people would drink during the months of waiting for the harvest to be ready. Life in this place is made much more tenuous by climate change. Smallholder farmers worldwide talk at length other everyday concerns that they have in a changing climate. In the world's high mountain ranges, Andean or Himalayan rural people are at special risk of GLOFs, glacial lake outburst floods, in which glacial lake water bursts a dam and rushes suddenly through the valleys and waterways where many smallholder farmers live and farm, too fast for people to escape. 
I've talked with hillside farmers in Zimbabwe, Nepal, Peru, Thailand, and elsewhere, whose orchards trees, their long-term investment are not flowering or bearing fruit anymore as the growing zones for those crops have recently shifted uphill or across latitudes. They do not have the ability to simply get new land elsewhere. So many have had to cut down their orchards and find different crops that will grow on the land they have, which is often too steep to grow annual crops. Likewise, their traditional crop varieties may, may no longer give reliable yields, forcing these farmers to find new varieties. These changes force labor migration, seasonal or permanent, from rural areas to cities, or even internationally, as people seek viable livelihoods. We know that the climate change resulting from our fossil fuel use is responsible for these rapid changes already tangibly affecting these smallholder farmers. Their lives are being forced to change. Are ours? Last week, Nigel Topping, the UK high level climate action champion for the COP26 climate talks, said that, cl that smallholder farmers are one of the most at risk groups from climate change. And he said that they are not, quote, helpless people standing around waiting for help. There's amazing resourcefulness and resilience, and we need more solidarity. We should not romanticize the lives of smallholder farmers, but we should do all we can to recognize and to support the dignity of their work. Farmers who work closely on their land are constantly attentive to their land and forests and neighbor creatures. They can be allies in the long work of conservation. Do our prayers before meals include thanks for the soil, water, and hands at home and in fields that produced the food? Do we intercede and advocate for the farm families dependent on marginal land, who care for land, and who lose land to more powerful interests, and also for those displaced by climate change? With this in mind, Come with me for a small foray into the past before we head into the future. The inspiration for this talk's title, Loving Our Future Neighbor, came from my historian colleague, Karen Johnson, who talks about her work as loving the dead. A professional mandate I found startling and one I had not thought much about before. She adopted this from fellow historians, including Beth Barton Schweiger and Margaret Bendroth who challenge us to use our professional knowledge, not as power, but for love, and to expand our conception of the communion of saints. They note that in doing the work of history, the call to love one's neighbor is extended to the dead. Similarly, theologian Miroslav Volf exhorts us to remember rightly. The goal of truthful memory, he says, is unhindered love of neighbor. This idea of intergenerational neighbor love to the past challenged me to consider the temporal and spatial boundaries in our understanding of neighborliness. The theologians and some others among us may be aware of the ancient debate about whether the original neighbor love mandate only applies to members of one's own ethnic or religious boundaries. Jesus' teaching to love even one's enemies and persecutors expanded rather than tighten to the circle. In Christian Mission in the Modern World in 1975, Stott wrote that in God's vocabulary, our neighbor includes our enemy and that to love means to do good. That is to give ourselves constructively and actively to serve our neighbor's welfare. So when we consider the communion of saints, who is included? We may envision people we know from the Bible, and especially in this early November time of year, remember people we know who have passed. Bendroth notes that our living awareness of the communion of saints as all God's people, past, present, and future, who form a single interdependent whole, can protect today's congregants against panic or despair as we are reminded of God's ongoing work in the world. Now, unlike these historians who seek to love the dead, my own work within environmental studies carries more of a future focus. This discipline analyzes scenarios and models of coming times 
to evaluate the best present courses of action. Consider for a moment your own professional and personal orientations. Is your field or possibly are you more past or future oriented? So as someone working in environmental studies, I wonder whom should I love in the future? How is that possible? This challenges us to go beyond a sense of responsibility or duty, long part of environmental conservation discourse, and which have also dominated the Christian stewardship paradigm. Does the call to love add a new dimension? Concern for future generations is not new. Generational concerns, implications and outcomes of current actions and charges related to one's offspring are woven throughout scripture. When speaking of how we bear witness to God's work in both creation and redemption, Stott often quoted Psalm 145, four. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. And of course, some future generations are already alive and speaking today. Children and young adults are using their voices to draw attention to their own and others' future in a warmer world on many topics. Are we listening ever more attentively to these voices right around and before us? The phrase future generations was referenced twice in the 1972 Statement on Human Environmental Responsibility developed by the Research Scientists Christian Fellowship and published by UCCF now nearly 50 years ago. First, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. The Christian's mandate is for the whole of humankind. It is not sectional and it includes future generations. This limits us severely, but constructively. And second, governments will need great reinforcing in their resolves to do good because every government is tempted to find favor by taking more out of nature than is necessary at the expense of future generations. Christian opinion is needed to help create a whole attitude to natural resources that will enable governments to do what in their responsible moments they would like to do, but dare not because of popular greed. The existentialist mood of living only in and for the present has to be fought here. That's from 1972. So we see that this concern for future generations is not new. And yet, this concern has evidently not yet brought about a sea change in our resource use. To understand this better, let's try a small exercise together. You'll need your paper again for this. Ready? Okay, so here is a list of people and animals and places. Take a moment to look at the list. And here are the instructions. We're going to prioritize the 15 things on this list for ourselves. Using the letters, kindly order them regarding your own sense of care for each item. Arrange them from most care to least care. This exercise may seem difficult or unfair. Well, I'm sorry, we're going to try it anyway. So this is for yourself, be honest. And I'm also sorry, but you'll have to work fast. I'll give you 30 seconds to do this, go. So who is our neighbor? Whom should we love and how? These are hard but essential questions when considering creation care. So let's look at our lists and I have some questions for you. How did you respond to being asked to do this exercise? Were you surprised about your ordering of people and animals and places? What surprised you? 
Where are animals on your list? How about wild places? Did you hesitate about where to place these items? Did anyone have your pets placed above your future great-grandchildren? And looking at your list, do you feel that there's a limit on whom you would consider a neighbor? This exercise might help us consider why our action on behalf of future generations is apparently so stymied. How expansive is our concept of neighborly care? Note how this list captures relative distance in both space and time. We may find it difficult enough to love those close to us, those we can see. This quandary is mentioned, of course, in 1 John 4.20. How about those who are distant from us in time and space? Can we actually come to love those we haven't seen or perhaps known or perhaps we'll never know directly? When we think of people in the future, those yet to be born, do we love them? If so, how do we act toward them? Care in some kind of abstract way, but to practically act in loving ways toward future unknown, unseen people? How about creatures and places that show God's handiwork? Let's think of this another way. Who, what, and where on this list does God not care about? Is anything here outside of the sustaining love of God? This is a question John Stott often considered. In a 1977 sermon, Stott detailed God's ongoing provision for birds and beasts, not only their food and water, but also importantly shelter and places to breed and to rest on migrations, the rhythm of days and nights and seasons and sport or play, and of course, their life and breath itself. He noted the familiar verses of Psalm 104, 24 to 25. The earth is full of your creatures. The sea is full of them also. And says this about, quote, Leviathan mentioned here as a general word for monsters of the deep of different kinds. God has formed them to sport in the sea. Did you ever know that God was concerned about Leviathan's sport? That he made provision for Leviathan to enjoy playtime in the ocean? The sea is depicted as a divinely supplied playground for all its creatures. And in a 1988 sermon, Stott referred to Psalms, Psalm 104's Leviathan as the divine pet. Now that's quite an image. We may be challenged to love ocean creatures. They are quite distant from us, but God makes a point to provide for them and to enjoy them. Are we capable of caring accordingly with God's help? And this brings us back to the matter of who are our neighbors. What bounds do we put on our conception of our neighbors? 2,000 years later, are we still echoing the curious lawyer's challenge to Jesus? Why? Are we still seeking to justify our human tendency to draw our neighborly circle ever closer? It's striking that Jesus' response is incongruent with our everyday use of the word neighbor as one who lives nearby. In Jesus' story reply, he goes out of his way to make neighborliness pointedly not about familiarity. The whole thing happens on a road, no one's home. We don't know for sure, but it seems the main characters didn't know each other. Care is given in a traveler's inn, perhaps one of several along the steep 25 kilometer road between Jerusalem and Jericho. The Samaritan was the epitome of the socially distant to Jesus' hearers. So what good is the nearby, the familiar, and the commonplace understanding of neighbor then? Well, let's move to discuss witness. I want to share with you a conversation I've been mulling over since it happened a decade ago in Bhutan. My environmental studies students and I met the National Spiritual Ecology Advisor, a highly educated Bhutanese scholar 
who advises the government on spiritual aspects of environmental policy. He framed the central modern dilemma he faces like this. Environmental protection is one of Bhutan's top national priorities. When most people were rural peasant farmers and believed in spiritual consequences of wrongdoing in animistic fashion, our conservation was easy and straightforward. We could simply forbid people to do something that would bear spiritual consequences and they would follow the rules. Don't put anything in the rivers or the guardian deities will be angry. Don't enter that forest or the demons who live there will harm you. But now that modernity has come in and people, especially youth and those moving to the city are losing their beliefs in spirits of place. What reason do they have for environmental protection anymore? What is our alternative to scaring people? All we have to offer them instead is a despiritualized secular science that comes along with importing Western style environmental education, ecology and conservation. And we don't want that for it carries with it the seeds of our cultural and natural destruction. His dilemma interests me greatly on three points. First, I wonder how many Christians feel a similar tension or disconnect between their faith and despiritualized environmental action, and so shy away from learning about the natural world, missing these windows to knowing God as creator and to worshiping God for the intricacy and beauty of life. Second, doesn't this suggest an open space where Christians could be in conversation with people asking such questions worldwide as we seek to articulate and to live out a robust creation care ethic? And third, with regard to climate change, is it similarly only a threat of future catastrophe or fear that can move Christians to act in ways that demonstrate love for those who are downstream and downwind or part of the communion of saints that will come after us? What does our care of creation have to do with the lived out nature of Christian witness? Scripture makes it clear that for a very long time indeed, God has been deeply concerned with how God's people use and relate to the natural world as part and parcel of their care for others' well being. The Old Testament is replete with examples. We see this in Ezekiel 34 18. Is it not enough for you to enjoy God's provision of food and water? without destroying it for others? Or Leviticus and Deuteronomy's charges to enact limits on our own consumption of agricultural produce in order to care for the needy and foreign gleaners? Or the woe to those practicing unchecked land acquisition in Isaiah 5, 8, till no space is left and you live alone in the land. Does our use of water, fields, and land give evidence to our care for others both now and in the future? Again, what does our care of creation have to do with the lived out nature of Christian witness? Stott often gave this simple reason. God intends our care of creation to reflect our love for the creator. As above, Stott clearly recognized that harming people's environments, both actively through overconsumption and passively through inaction when they are harmed, is a failure to love our neighbor. In his book, Issues Facing Christians Today, in 2006, Stott noted that Christians have a distinctive contribution to make to ecological action in the public sphere, because acknowledging God as creator and looking forward to the day when it is made new, give us an appropriate respect for the earth, indeed for the whole material creation, since God both made it and will remake it. In consequence, we must learn to think and act ecologically. We repent of extravagance, pollution, and wanton destruction. Here, we see Stott's connection of creation care with a second of his neglected but essential characteristics in his final book, The Radical Disciple. His chapter on simplicity points us toward the 1980 International Consultation on Simple Lifestyle that Stott co-convened with Ron Sider. We see that these two, 
creation care, and simplicity are bound together. Simple lifestyle is where neighbor love and witness come together. The 1980 Consultation on Simple Lifestyle invited people from different contexts, wealthy and poorer nations, to discuss this complex, conflictual, and deeply felt issue. Sound familiar? Paragraph nine of the 1974 Lausanne Covenant had stated, those of us who live in affluent circumstances accept our duty to develop a simple lifestyle in order to contribute more generously to both relief and evangelism. The consultation came about because, in Sider's words, as Stott traveled throughout the world after the 1974 Congress, he was asked by third world Christians if Western Christians really meant the statement on simple lifestyle in the Lausanne Covenant. So Stott proposed the international consultation, spawning a multi-year process of local study groups on the topic worldwide, culminating in a five-day gathering near London in 1980, bringing together 85 evangelical leaders from 27 countries. The first two sections of the resulting Lausanne paper, an evangelical commitment to simple lifestyle, are on creation and stewardship. Subsequent sections discuss poverty and wealth, generosity and sharing among believers, and personal lifestyle that highlights the life of obedient, faithful integrity, saying this. Our Christian obedience demands a simple lifestyle, irrespective of the needs of others. Nevertheless, the facts that 800 million people are destitute and that 10,000 die of starvation every day make any other lifestyle indefensible. The commitments section on evangelism links the broader work of the church to lifestyle and witness of ordinary believers. Saying this, the church is not yet taking seriously its commission to be witnesses to the ends of the earth from Acts 1.8. So the call to a responsible lifestyle must not be divorced from the call to responsible witness. For the credibility of our message is seriously diminished whenever we contradict it by our lives. It is impossible with integrity to proclaim Christ's salvation if he has evidently not saved us from greed or his lordship if we are not good stewards of our possessions or his love if we close our hearts against the needy. These discomforting words bring to mind a challenge from Ugandan Anglican Bishop David Zach Nirenkie. Let's not talk to the poor about their poverty. Let's talk to the rich about our greed, which is a result of idolatry, of ourselves, our insatiable wishes and consumptive desires, which also bear grave consequences for God's people and God's world. In issues facing Christians today, Stott noted that at the root of the ecological crisis is human greed. Stott emphasized the lived out nature of Christian witness, that our lives are our message. Speaking about Matthew five through seven, Stott said, Jesus did not give us an academic treatise calculated merely to stimulate the mind. I believe he meant his Sermon on the Mount to be obeyed. What should human life and human community look like when they come under the gracious rule of God? Different. Different. Different looks like our lived out care of creation shining as it reflects our love for the creator. Different looks like ministers of reconciliation following our diverse callings to be agents of healing and restoration and regeneration and hope in the most ecologically depleted, eroded, contaminated, and forgotten places of God's world, at the margins where God is always active. Different looks like God's people pursuing environmental justice in mass, which means desiring and living in such a way that others' places would be as beautiful and life-giving as what we would want to inhabit ourselves, the high standard for neighbor love. Different 
looks like Christ's followers only putting in the soil, water, and air of God's created world what we would like to live nearby ourselves and advocating for the same all throughout other airsheds and watersheds. Let's revisit now the place you remembered at the beginning and wrote down. Take that name and sketch of your beautiful and life-giving place. Add in a sketch of a child and a non-human animal there as well, representing the future inhabitants of that place, next season and next generation. At the break, put this up somewhere that you'll see it daily. A mirror works well. And when you see it, pause to pray. Stop and remember. Pray for your future neighbors, the people and other creatures who could also enjoy your place in times to come. May this bring the distant near. May God show us how to act lovingly toward our future neighbors. Friends, COP26 concludes tomorrow, the 26th almost annual event. So during this one generation of COPs, the future from the first one in 1995 has now become the present, with measurable impacts of climate change more evident on so many fronts. In 2006, Stott noted that, quote, the environment has, once again, become an important agenda item at world summits. Yet, it is easier to sign treaties than to live lives that are consistent with good trusteeship of God's world. Why is this? We are fully habituated to creation harming practices that persist. May God help us to make new habits. And in the words of Tear Fund USA's Emily Sarmiento, to build the new ruts we want to stay in. We might start by learning from the Baptist churches in Burma who have each member plant a tree every June 1st. And then in the service, members stand before the congregation to share about the current health and status of all their trees planted on previous June 1sts. Commitment, action, accountability, making more places beautiful and life-giving, bearing witness and loving their future neighbors. I would like to conclude by sharing with you one of my favorite indoor places in Wheaton, which is standing right in front of this mosaic, the luminous one. This depicts Jesus' conversation with another Samaritan, an encounter that transforms her into a carrier of the good news. The mosaic is made of over 63,000 tesserae of glass, ceramic, and stone set deep into wet mortar. At the mosaic's dedication, artist Leah Samuelson said that this process is a tangible reminder that the mosaic of our life is just like that, forms formed by tens of thousands of pieces, carefully chosen and deliberately placed. The mortar hardens. Those pieces that we have deliberately selected, chiseled and positioned are what will eventually form the mosaic of our lives that are not our own at all. This is what's visible after decades of living, what's evident to all who knew us at our eventual funerals. It's not fancy or exotic or spectacular. It's simply, very simply, the collection created by 63,000 everyday choices of this over that, which builds the life pattern or picture by the guidance and grace of the one who lives in us. Lives of faithfulness are not big splashy events. They are constructed one tessera at a time, or as Ruth Valerio says, many little steps in the right direction bearing witness in ways that reflect love for our creator and demonstrate love for our neighbors near and far, current and future. And let's conclude with this prayer written by John Stott. Almighty God, you created the planet Earth. You make peace and you love justice. 
Give your own concern for the environment to those who are destroying it. Your peace to the violent places of the world and your justice to the deprived and the oppressed. And show us what we can do to forward your purposes of love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Laura, thank you so much for that lecture. Thank you for everything that you've shared with us there. And um, I think we've got Thomas Creedy with us from IVP. Uh, Thomas, I'm gonna invite you to uh, switch on your, your camera and uh, turn on your mic and to tell us a little bit about um, the book. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, and thanks again to Laura for, for trusting us at IVP with this project. Um, it's probably the largest book I've worked on. It's definitely got the longest list of references um, and it quotes from or references 41 out of 66 books of the Bible um, with Revelation featuring quite highly uh, for the question on the on the end times. This is a, a book and a topic and a theme which actually Revelation speaks to a lot. Um, and I should say almost almost by way of apology or introduction, we didn't know about COP26 or we, it wasn't really on our radar as a publishing thing when this book kind of arrived with us. Um, but we saw in what Sam had pulled together and what Laura had kind of finessed and what Stott was saying, this prophetic foresight that Chris Wright um, talks about in his kind of commendations. And so we thought, well, it's it, in some ways, it's a strange thing to publish. We've got loads of fantastic books on uh, creation care and living simply. We've got Stott's The Radical Disciple. We've got Dave Bookless's books. His surname is a misnomer and they're very good too. Um, but we saw this as a book we could publish as part of the Stott centenary celebrations to do something a bit different. So one of the things that I loved um, as an editor kind of reading through this is this theme of not domination, but dominion, this idea of stewardship, this idea of planetary gardening, as Ruth Padilla de Borst writes um, in her kind of afterword to the book. And it's something that's really important to get. We need to use the right words when we're talking about this sort of thing. And that's something that Stott does beautifully. Um, and, and Sam and Laura kind of trace his development from, well, I think it's important to this is really, really, really important. Um, and that also changed the way we produce the book. Uh, so if you could show us the next slide again, uh, Dave, that'd be brilliant. Um, this is a little bit sad and a little bit nerdy, but it shows what we hope um, is, is some kind of obedience. So in, in the inside of the book, it says this book is 100% recyclable. So you can literally put it in your recycling bin. Um, please don't, please please buy it and read it, um, preferably outside, uh, but please buy it and read it um, and don't put it in your recycling bin. But when you're done with it, or if it really offends you, you can do that. Um, even down to things like the ink. I was sent just the cover uh, because it turns out that we'd not done a cover that was fully recyclable before. Um, and our art director was very worried that the color was colors would run. Um, so if you want to end up buying the hardback, you are buying, I think, IVP's first 100% recyclable book, which may be the first Christian recyclable book, but don't quote me on that. Um, whereas if you buy the ebook, you save a lot of money, uh, a little bit of shelf space. And that's the final slide that I should point out to you is that um, we've got a bit of a kind of a launch offer going on at the moment. If you head to ivpbooks.com, probably should have put the link on there, but there we go, ivpbooks.com. Um, and you find it, the hardback is 14 99 normally 20 pounds. It's how many pages is it? Should say there. Oh, it doesn't say there. It's about three hundred and twenty pages, um, and it is it is a nice little nice little size. Uh, whereas the ebook is fifty percent off with that code, um, which will expire soon. And yeah, I would say this makes a gift for two kinds of people over Christmas. One is preachers who are maybe going, "Gosh, the uh, the cop has happened, and now I need to care about creation care, and I don't know what the Bible says." Or well, forty-one of the sixty-six books of, of of scripture that we have are quoted in this and referenced deeply, and so it could be a really good tool for a preacher who's maybe panicking slightly. And the other um, people it would be a good gift for would be those who are a bit sceptical or wary of this crazy environmentalism, um, which which you know even John Stott apparently. And I love um, a quote from one of the people who read it before we published it. So this is not a secular environmentalism with a little God talk added on, but a distinctly Christian environmentalism born of faith in a triune creator God. And what um, what Laura was saying about the kind of the spiritual turn into modernity where we kind of lose lose something. That's exactly what Stott is showing us. He's showing us from the Bible, this living God, giving us a living faith to care for God's living creation. 
So I commend it to you. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks again to Laura uh, for both writing and, and speaking so eloquently. Thanks so much, Thomas. That's great. Let me move on to this slide here, um, which is about another book that Laura has edited, um, Living Radical Discipleship. Um, it's voices from around the world uh, and with a commendation here from the wonderful Vinoth Ramachandra from Sri Lanka. Um, it's a really, really good book. Now, we have a whole bunch of questions, Laura, and we're sadly not going to be able to go through all of them tonight. Um, but let me start with one that's very topical, um, which was asked, I think there were one or two questions that refer to this, but I think Chris Horn probably asked the first one here uh, about COP26. Um, let me just find that question. At this moment, through COP26, how hopeful are you about the next steps for the climate and the issues we especially see in vulnerable communities? Great, what a good and timely question, as you note. And uh, Dave, maybe after I've said just a few words, maybe you can give some insights because you were actually there um, from, from what you had. Um, just a, a few things occurred to me um, with this uh, great question. One is just like the 1980 International Consultation on Simple Lifestyle, one of the things I appreciate about um, COP and, and this COP26 in particular um, is the visibility, uh, creating a, a forum for um, understanding realities of people in remote places. Um, it can be very hard to imagine sometimes uh, how climate change is affecting people and um, having a forum for the small, small island nations and for others um, to be able to, to speak to that um, I think that is something that uh, is hopeful that we would want to encourage. Um, and I can also see ways that perhaps people who um, would have been following COP26 may have taken this up as, as new interest. And one of the hopes that I have is that um, churches all around the world would connect with other churches to have conversations about, um, about these topics. So um, what would it look like if a church in, uh, in London or in Glasgow or in Wheaton or um, somewhere in France were to connect with churches uh, in the small island nations or um, with those throughout Africa, maybe through their um, uh, denominational connections or their diocese or something, uh, or maybe through organizations that will connect churches. Tier Fund does that a lot, for example. Um, but if they were to have conversations um, through different groups, uh, youth to youth, women to women, elderly, um, intergenerational kinds of conversations about um, the impact that climate change is having on the places where they are. It's not only in um, the majority world or global south, but of course those in, in Europe can speak to that as well. Um, and to understand the realities in industrialized settings, in agrarian settings, um, geographically, generationally, socioeconomically, politically, spiritually, of course, and uh, to be able to, to have those conversations. I hope that's one of the things that can be spawned from these kinds of um, interactions. So I'm um, hopeful for that. Also that the um, increasing recognition and acknowledgement and maybe um, public awareness of uh, the causes of climate change um, can be ever um, spreading and growing and uh, that that may be something also brought into churches um, for, for prayer as well. So recognizing, of course, that this is not easy. One of the things about spending so much time with things from past years and commitments from past years is just this recognition that things are not easy or solved overnight. Um, but that is where um, the church is the institution that is there for the long haul in all of the places where we are. And uh, that would be something where we can pick up when um, a big conference ends, the church will still be there next Sunday and next Sunday and next Sunday. So what are the ways um, that we can uh, continue that work? But Dave, you were there um, at COP26 yourself. So um, any insights? I was there briefly, yes, last weekend. And I've been in constant contact with sort of dozens of uh, WhatsApp messages coming in every hour, it seems, from <laughs> the groups who are up there. And yes, I mean, there are masses of Christians there in Glasgow taking part in discussions, both around the fringes and some right at the heart of the negotiations as well. 
And I think one of the things I found most encouraging there was that one or two organizations such as Tear Fund and the Renew Our World Coalition, and you showed a slide about them, had importantly brought over people from India, Panama, Malawi, and elsewhere, so that we were hearing direct about the impacts that climate change is having on our sisters and brothers around the world now. The other thing I found so encouraging, and I think this is quite a change, certainly within the UK, is the way in which young people have become so seriously uh, and passionately engaged on this issue. Um, and, you know, obviously we know about Greta, but young Christians are really involved on this. And the Young Christian Climate Network, which has grown this year, uh, were there in force in, in Glasgow and just to hear how articulate, how passionate, how biblical, how prayerful uh, young Christians are about, are about this issue is, is really, really encouraging. Um, if we're talking about the politics of COP26, we're not going to get the solution that we need. Um, I think barring a miracle, um, we can say that we are not going to get an agreement that takes us to staying under 1.5. Um, and it's arguable about whether that window will be open in future. And as has been said by some of the experts on this, every 0.1 of a degree that the temperature goes up beyond 1.5 is going to affect the livelihoods and quite potentially the lives of tens of millions of people and of whole ecosystems. So this is very serious and very important. And even if we don't get the agreement that is needed uh, by the end of tomorrow or into Saturday night, quite possibly, um, we're going to need to make sure that at COP27 in Egypt next year, uh, that, that the governments are, have their heads knocked together again. And we need to pray. We need to communicate with our own politicians. Uh, we need to use every tool in the toolbox to try and get the world to, to, to come round on this issue. So that was one of the questions. We've got so many here. Um, one that I know you found fascinating as, as you and I were just chatting about the questions, Laura, is this one about, I think it was, I can't remember who asked it now, um, but it was about whether this is an area that's fruitful for interfaith work, that uh, creation care, you know, all those who believe in a, here we are, Rod McCrory's question, creation care seems to be one of the highest common concerns of different faith traditions. That's certainly reflected at COP26. What would John Stott make of interfaith cooperation, particularly on this issue? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I wish I uh, knew more about um, uh, any direct work that may have happened on that. I don't know of that, perhaps, um, perhaps you do. Um, but what I think I, I do see and from reading so much about Stott um, on this topic, but on others, is that he welcomed every opportunity that he ever had um, to share about the reason uh, for the hope within him and also the fullness of God's good news. So um, including often with those who didn't share his beliefs. So um, I think that uh, I don't know that there were um, initiatives at that time on this uh, that, that he was involved with that I know of, um, but uh, it does seem like something that um, he would not shy away from the opportunity to um, share, uh, to share on this from the biblical perspective. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I don't know of, of, of John Stott and specifically interfaith things. Um, I do know that he was incredibly gracious in dealing with Christians of very different views, those who were far more liberal in their theology, those who were from Catholic or Orthodox traditions. He was incredibly gracious in how he dealt with those. And he, he spoke at the founding conference for Arosha in the Lebanon, uh, which must be one of the most religiously diverse countries on earth. And yeah. where Arosha has worked with Christians from Maronite and Catholic and Orthodox and evangelical backgrounds, and has worked with Muslims from Sunni and Shia backgrounds and from people from the Druze community. And John Stott showed a great interest in that work. And he also showed a real interest when our first project in Arusha UK was in a part of London where the majority religions are Sikh and Muslim and Hindu and Christians are, are a minority. So he certainly believed in creation care in those contexts. Um, we, can, we can certainly say that. Um, Let's move on to give as much opportunity as we can. 
And um, I think Jane Dunn asked a question. I'm just trying to find it here again, um, but one that you thought we should deal with quickly. Um, and it's disappeared down my list. I'm trying to remember. Oh, here, I, I have it here. You have it, go on. You read I, the question then and answer it as well. Uh, Jane, oops, sorry, just lost it. Uh, here we are, I've got it now. Loved your point regarding commitment, action and accountability in relation to a tree. Any other ideas of other actions, other things that we can do practically? Yeah, great question. And one of the things that's hard um, about working in creation care is that it can just seem so overwhelming and huge. Um, and so I appreciate the practicality of these examples from churches uh, and, and individuals who are doing things or communities who are doing things. Um, and uh, I just would like to commend uh, to you one of the things that um, uh, from environmental education, an environmental uh, educator colleague of mine um, had, these, had these four points. Um, you could summarize them as pick, practice, invite, repeat. Uh, and it was basically this, um, pick one thing, um, practice it into a habit, invite others to come along and repeat. Um, so starting with one thing and having that thing be the thing that people do together. So whether that's um, trees or whether that's uh, making changes in diets or whether that's uh, something within the church and um, you know, use of uh, materials or, or resources within the church or allocation of budget perhaps, um, having one thing be a starting point so that there can be actionable um, items there. And those will be very different. Uh, from one community to another, rural communities and urban communities, large churches and small churches, um, different generations would have different uh, kinds of things. But I think that's um, uh, just the encouragement to have something that would fit uh, the, the place where um, you are, but importantly, not alone. Uh, so importantly, with others and something that can then be repeated and carried on in order to um, see that, uh, that change over time. So I love when I hear um, examples like that, that churches have, have taken on. I, I really like that, um, Laura. I think, you know, people often feel this, issue, this, this whole issue is so vast and they often think, where on earth can I start? How can I make a difference? And so finding the one thing, but also finding others to do it with, I, I think that's really, really important. Now, I'm gonna to go to the top of the list in a minute, but I'm just gonna ask one other question, which you'd identified from Clive Mother. Um, if we're to embrace our calling as daughters and sons of God and fully respond in love to our neighbour, is repentance a necessary first step ind individually and collectively? And Clive Mather's writing from Itosha in Namibia, I think. Yes, well, that's where, that's where his heart is, at least. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you, Clive, for this good question. Uh, colleague from Tear Fund and Tear Fund USA. Um, and uh, I just think it's, it's such an important point um, that you make here that repentance as a necessary first step because of this is of course the heart and the soul of what the church is always doing and calling us to. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I really came to understand in seeing how creation care came to be important and increasingly important to John Stott throughout his life was really um, seeing the way in which this area of discipleship came to be recognized as more and more important. Um, so we can see a bit of a crescendo throughout his life of commitment, of interest, of um, commitment with uh, action and being directly involved with organizations that worked in creation care. Um, and of course, this is something that the church is always uh, calling us to. Sometimes is it uh, within the bounds of what we see as something from which we need to repent. And I think that's one of the things that um, expanding to this uh, full view of the good news, uh, that we can see the ways in which this is an area. And um, yeah, John Stott did not mince words on this at all. This is uh, something that um, we just were not often seeing as something that needed uh, to be within the Lordship of Christ or something that, uh, how we live or um, something that uh, was a sin requiring repentance. 
And um, yeah, that was, I think that's an area where the church has a huge role to play with bringing this um, to um, consideration and for attention, something that we may not have um, appreciated, that that may be something that should be part of our um, repentance and also his emphasis on things that are done and left undone and have that be um, built into our, our liturgies of worship as well. Thank you. I'm going to try and combine um, some questions so that we can cover as many as possible. And um, there are several here relating to uh, the cost of going eco-friendly. Um, would, uh, from Natasha Burt, good question there about um, how can we put this higher on our agenda whilst also being relevant to the poor. So they're about the cost. And then there's one from David Nussbaum um, about would Jesus drive a Tesla? Um, should we be welcoming um, technological innovation that enables us to keep up our lifestyles whilst going greener? How does all of this fit in with what Uncle John had to say on simple lifestyle? Yeah, what wonderful questions. And I, I appreciate these um, a lot. Uh, one of the things that really has been striking to me in um, working on issues of sustainability that people are facing is often it seems to be at two ends of the spectrum. If I think sometimes of who uh, eats organic food, for example, it would seem to be those, um, the smallholder farmers that I work with who are growing their own food and would not financially be um, affording pesticides. So they are eating locally grown organic food. And then at the other end of the spectrum, those who would be uh, importing that or, or being able to access that, which would often in our current economy um, carry these higher costs. And uh, so you, we have this kind of split over um, who uh, can be living in these ways. As churches um, uh, put this higher on their agenda, I also wonder whether um, this would be one of the things that as churches talk to each other across um, North and South or East and West or different kinds of uh, geographic areas to have um, ideas from the church in another place of what uh, recommendations, are there things that they are doing that another church could also be doing together um, in order to, what are some things that they are doing, for example, um, to um, relate to the needs directly in the place uh, where they are. So for example, are there ways that um, the spending can uh, be sharing of resources with others uh, in their local communities that may also um, uh, have other benefits for, for people in other places. So having that be um, one of the ways that uh, the church can always be engaging the people right, um, right in the area where they are. To the Tesla question, um, this is a great question. If John Stott were still alive and hiring a car to drive on a bird watching holiday, uh, would, he, would he rent a Tesla? Uh, that's a great thought question. I know that he took taxis sometimes. I don't know that he ever owned a car of his own. Um, he also walked a lot. So maybe bicycles are in the mix. Um, and I think uh, looking at um, the uh, range of innovations that um, are, are coming in are always things to be following. I know um, just last night, actually, I was at a lecture with um, a congressperson here from our local district who said, uh, you know, that soon the day is coming when the overall cost for electric cars uh, would be lower. And at that point, um, the debates will uh, go away about um, using them. So um, I think, uh, yeah, having um, uh, people involved in working in science uh, on the issues of uh, batteries and uh, the technologies is a really important area also um, for Christians to be engaged. Can I just push you a tiny bit further, Laura? This isn't one of the questions here, although it relates to them, um, about how possible it is to live a simple life in the midst of our Western consumer uh, economic growth is the great idol cultures. Um, and, and do feel free to share personally. I've, you know, I've, I've, I've got a friend who's stayed with you and who's told me about how you grow vegetables in your garden how you visit thrift shops to, to buy clothing wherever possible. Um, how do we resist the, the pull, the gravitational pull of just 
more, more, more stuff that we don't need, stuff that's bad for us, stuff that's destroying the planet, stuff that destroys our relationships. How do we live simpler lifestyles in the midst of, of what we're surrounded by? Hmm. Yeah, so many different ways. And I think it's definitely not something done uh, individually, um, something that is done in community. Even just the examples that you give of so many people who garden, we learn gardening from and with others, and we can do that together with others. And also uh, thrift stores wouldn't exist if people didn't share. Um, so uh, I think um, it comes with asking questions, not a surprising answer from me, but there are a number of questions um, that I know people ask or that I have up on post-its on my wall. Um, so what are the decisions uh, as we make different decisions? What are decisions that would, um, what are the outcomes of this decision? Are there, so we have to have an event um, or we have some uh, kind of thing that we're doing, what are the ways that we can do this that bear testimony to um, the core beliefs that we have? And uh, are there ways of doing things differently? One of the things about um, the pandemic that we have learned is that things can be done differently. And uh, there are these outcomes and maybe some of those things we need to keep. Um, I, I remember an, an email exchange with uh, Kuki Rokum, who's um, at your house and also was on the top 26 slides. Uh, and uh, she wrote to me that um, several months into the pandemic, the skies in Delhi were blue and birds that no one knew lived there all the time were suddenly visible. And um, just the kinds of uh, the fact that we're having a virtual event uh, that people can join without traveling. Um, what are some of the things that we can do differently and keep that uh, keep those things going? The pressures are tremendous um, to uh, to keep up with things, um, and uh, it just I think one of the hopeful things for me was the lesson of this with the mosaic, um, because everything at once is too much, but it really is so many choices, um, thousands of choices that that we make every time uh, we have a meal, we're sort of voting for the future in a way. Um, so what are the choices that we're making there? And um, doing that together with others, uh, with locals who are just around you with a community of people in your church or in your neighborhood. Um, but then also uh, there are so many resources, uh, Ruth Valerio's books, um, your books <laughs> and others that can give people um, ideas and inspiration for how to do that. And also um, testimonies of people who, um, have been able to, um, yeah, maybe came from very, um, uh, very consumptive lifestyles and who have made decisions that dial that back in different ways. So those kind of um, testimonies and, and lived witness of that, um, I think, can be uh, very encouraging for all of us, for all of us, as well as seeing um, big decisions that some churches have made. For example, on, on spending, I know of some churches that um, have foregone certain kinds of remodeling projects on their own in order to do that for churches somewhere else uh, or do some, some other kind of project. Um, so uh, yeah, just sometimes it takes not only the small things, but also asking big questions about allocating resources. Thank you. Now we're, we're running short on time, but I want to get through uh, two or three more questions if I can. Um, there's one that uh, quite a number of people have upvoted here that's a bit different from the other ones we've looked at, which is about population. Um, your presentation didn't mention population growth, but according to the UN, we might well be up to over 10 billion people by 2060, many of those in Africa. Um, how, how, how does this fit in? Um, is, is population a distraction from the real issues for us here in the West? Is this important? Um, it suggests here that we should be targeting the education and empowerment of women, um, uh, particularly to address population. W would you like to comment on all of that? Yeah, great question. And um, one that you'll see, uh, especially from the, it, that you will see in the John Stott on Creation Care book was a high concern to John Stott. So from the very beginning, the first time he started writing on creation care, um, not in his sermons, but in other things in, in his um, books about living in the modern world, population was often the first category uh, mentioned. Of course, that was in the 1970s when this was very much um, coming to the, to the um, front of people's attention. And um, that 
you know, has continued to be uh, something that um, is a, a major concern uh, in, in places um, with families and with uh, places that I've lived, especially with um, smallholder farmers. So some of the things, and you rightly point here to um, women's education and empowerment being absolutely critical in people being able to have um, healthier families and um, really the well-being of all the children who are in a family um, and also of uh, especially of the women who are bearing them and that can never be forgotten and should be um, put sort of right at the forefront of um, something that uh, the church and, and Christian agencies are are working on. Um, I'll just give an, an example here. Um, we with my husband and I, we lived uh, for many years and the work that I've um, been doing in Timor-Leste in East Timor, uh, you saw many pictures of that in the presentation, a place very uh, close to my heart, was um, upon independence uh, in sort of 1999, 2002 timeframe, they had for a time the highest birth rate in the world. And I think it was over eight um, live births per women was actually the, the figure that was given at that time. And um, some of that comes out of, and there's another question about conflict. Some of that comes very common in post-conflict uh, situations and so many people have been lost. So there is a sense of rebuilding the nation um, that can often come. But uh, with, um, with that and spending so much time with women who were in their um, 10th, or 12th or 14th pregnancies and um, the, the weariness that they um, had with that and, the, um, and uh, the health concerns. Also, they were aware that many of their um, aunts and um, grandmothers and others that they knew died during those um, at the sort of in their last pregnancy, would have been their last one. Uh, so the, the risks um, going up for them just um, exponentially with that many pregnancies. And um, I remember very distinctly congratulating um, someone when I learned that she was pregnant and she just started crying and she loved her children very much, but um, she was also aware of um, the difficulties that they were having at that time. That was the year that the corn was buried in the typhoon and she was pregnant. And she knew that they didn't have food and she wouldn't have the food that she needed to be healthy in that time. Um, so uh, certainly um, uh, women's education and um, the capacity to have um, empowered conversations within their families and societies uh, are right up there um, at the, the top of the list, as well as all of the ways to be involved in sustainable um, practices in other areas. Of, of their lives and societies. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's see if we can maybe, I, I don't know if it's possible to give quick answers to some of these, but um, here's one which, which I certainly have been asked a number of times. Only humans can be saved or lost. Jesus sent us to make disciples. So creation care is a distraction from evangelism. How would you, or how do you think John Stott would have answered that? Great question. Uh, so uh, he did answer it. Read the book. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, this is this is something where he would just have um, really kind of uh, forthrightly denied a, a separation. Um, and even in some of the um, uh, some of the uh, the comments that I, I shared there was that this is an integral part of Christian witness. And um, yeah, so that was answered not only in his own writings, but also in um, larger writings of which he was part and contributed. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna slip in one here that's close to my heart. Um, you widened the potential definition of neighbors, not just to people alive today, but to future generations, uh, and also potentially to animals, marine creatures, ecosystems, and uh, Marie-Louise says, is it good exegesis to say that animals, ecosystems, and not just other humans are my neighbor? The wind widening of the boundaries of neighbor in the parable seems to suggest it is. So Jesus widened the boundary in, in telling the parable. So can we therefore legitimately widen the boundaries further as we apply that in today's context? Well, um, 
I'll leave the exegesis to you, the theologian, <laughs> and other colleagues of yours. Um, but one of the one of the real striking things for me, just in this, I mean, we've all read this parable and heard it and heard sermons on it, you know, maybe hundreds of them. Um, and one of the real striking things for me was uh, that um, this was not uh, th that it did happen on a road. And um, that had never quite struck me in that same way before. Um, it wasn't uh, about the close and familiar, which is of course, you know, the whole point, we, we know that. Um, but uh, to have um, the, one, of the, one of the challenges that I had in working with Stott's materials on this was his constantly going back, of course, to birds, you know, books on birds and lots on birds and have Leviathan in there as well. And um, really to uh, say that he was highlighting this in ways that um, I think were probably challenging to many people hearing at that time, um, but also uh, for myself. And um, do, I, do I see, do I really take that on board um, as, uh, as being as close to God's care as um, it evidently was. Uh, so if we have all of the times that Jesus talked about animals and uh, not only as examples being used, but also just directly about care um, through uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, so many examples that we can see. Um, and the, the sort of counter question there is, is there something outside of God's care? And uh, we have not evidence for that. So. Yeah, I think it's something um, that not only we can continue to think about, but what are the implications of that? Uh, what are the ways that we will live differently and be different um, if we really take on board uh, that these um, creatures matter to God as much as they evidently did? Thank you. I'm gonna ask one final question and it's from someone who I know is joining us from the States, Brittany Michalski. Uh, which is the more biblical argument for creation care? Care for creation because it does good for current and future neighbors, especially humans, or care for creation because it belongs to and is for Jesus? Assuming they're equally biblical, why is it that the anthropocentric, the people-centered arguments seem to be the more compelling? What a great question. <laughs> not an easy one, um, but not to give too long of an answer here. Um, I think these are these two sides that you've, you've summarized uh, so well, Brittany. Thank you for the question. Um, and uh, one of the things that interests me is in the stock materials, he would often refer to both. Um, that these are, uh, that the care of, uh, care of creation should reflect our love for the creator. And that simple statement was one he came back to over and over and over again. So um, while uh, we definitely also have, as I've mentioned and is evident throughout all of scripture, um, that uh, care for others is there, um, I wonder whether we have not, um, whether the kind of duty and responsibility and care for others uh, that end of the duty and responsibility have not been compelling us enough to action. And that may be why we see that we are where we are. Um, so it may be that uh, we really do need to revisit the um, care for creation uh, mandate as reflecting our love for the creator. And um, is that insufficient? Is that something we really need to take seriously? And if we would see um, environmental harm that we do or things that we fail to um, intervene on, uh, if we would see that as a failure to love God and take that um, to heart as seriously as that, then um, would it be somehow compelling us in a different way? Um, I wonder whether the duty and responsibility is not sufficient to drive to action. And this is where really the um, reminder of love uh, yes. comes back. And this call to love, um, which is uh, what we know of for God and for neighbor. Um, maybe the duty and responsibility isn't, uh, isn't kind of really what we're called to do um, in, its, in that sort of um, very bounded way. 
but uh, love would overflow that. And duty and responsibility is maybe the low bar. Love goes so far above that and beyond that. And if, do we take that seriously? So if we were to ask ourselves every day, um, is this action or are, are these sets of decisions um, expressing love in practical and tangible ways uh, for God and for others? Um, how will I uh, make decisions and will we um, live differently as a result? Thank you so much, Laura. I think that's a fantastic note to finish on, that this isn't just about duty and about responsibility, it's about love. Love for our neighbours, but also love for God. And that drives us to loving and caring for God's creation that was made ultimately for his glory uh, by and for Jesus Christ, as Paul puts it in Colossians. Laura, thank you so much for all that you shared. I know you've put many, many hours into preparing this evening. Thank you so much for all of that. Thank you for your whole lifetime of wisdom that's gone into this. And thank you for the, the book as well, for editing that based on all that Sam Berry had already done and on John Stott's wonderful writing. Um, I think there's, there's plenty here, not just for this evening, but to carry us a lot further. And I really hope these conversations will be able to continue uh, in all sorts of ways, in our churches, in the communities where we are, and uh, I'm sure online as well.